Hi, welcome back everyone. I hope everyone had a lovely lunch and had the chance to indulge in some barbecue. I wanna give a quick thank you to Secondhand Smoke for joining us today at Crystal Bridges and cooking up some great barbecue. So continuing our day of conversations, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome back a longtime friend of Crystal Bridges in the momentary, Nick Cave. Nick Cave is an artist, educator, and foremost, a messenger, working between the visual performing arts through a wide range of mediums, including sculpture, installation, video, sound, and performance. Cave is well known for his sound suits, sculptural forms based on the scale of his body, initially created in direct response to the police beating of Rodney King in 1991. Sound suits camouflage the body, masking and creating a second skin that conceals race, gender, and class, forcing the viewer to look without judgment. They serve as a visual embodiment of social justice that represent both brutality and empowerment. Drawing from his experiences and career as an artist and educator, Nick will shed new light today on the themes and ideas behind his acclaimed sound suits and the Dirty South. Joining Nick in conversation this afternoon is Associate Curator Alejo Benedetti, who also had the honor of serving as Venue Curator for the Dirty South Exhibition here at Crystal Bridges. Please join me in welcoming Nick and Alejo. All right, well, welcome back first off. Thank you. Uh, we, were, we were just saying, Third time that you have that you have been here giving giving a talk. You've been here even more times. Third time you've been here giving a talk. Three different curators each time. Third time's a charm. I finally get to, to be up on stage <laughs> with Nick, which is which is great. Um, and, and it's it's especially exciting to have you here within the context of Dirty South Weekend and within the context of the incredible Dirty South exhibition. And so I wanted to start really by thinking about how there are so many different ways that artists interact with the South. And different artists, some artists who, who live in the South and work their entire career in the South, others who go away and then look back. Um, and you grew up in Missouri. And so I would love to hear your take on how, you know, is, the Missouri, is Missouri the South and does it sort of... <laughs> Yeah, we're going to start out, that is how we're starting off. <laughs> Would I? No. No. I don't think so. Interesting. Why, why, why would you say that? I'd say it's like the Midwest. We're getting, yeah. It's, like not, even, yeah, it's, it's not far enough down. Not far enough down. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what would you say is your sort of... Uh, R relationship with the with the South more more broadly then. I think more broadly, it's really sort of um, you know when I think about family, uh, you know my family came up from Louisiana, uh, and so I think that's really where it's rooted uh, and settled in in Missouri. Yeah. Well, and and so you have been in Chicago for uh, for a while mm -hmm. for a while now. Um, how how frequently are you are you thinking back to you know your your family having origins in Louisiana, uh, or thinking back to Missouri, or thinking back to to these different places as you are as you are thinking about the work that you're that you're doing? I'm not. I don't know if I. I don't know if I consciously think about it. Sure. Uh, I think it definitely. Um, it plays a role in in the way that I'm thinking about my work, sort of as it as it as well as as, as I am sort of moving sort of forward. Um, you know, I think I've been gone for so long that you know I'm sort of Chicago is my base, but I sort of operate in this sort of global mm -hmm. sort of way that it's the hub, but I work in this global sort of mindset. So whether I feel that any place is where I'm sort of 
settled or that sort of is roots. I don't know if I'm sort of, if I would say Chicago is the final destination. Sure. Um, because I sort of am interested in the world and, and you know, how do I sort of uh, stay relevant in that sort of sense? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so as, as you think about that, like, and as you're thinking about um, these, different, these different things that are driving, driving your practice and, and maybe how, how sort of travel is, is also um, inspiring your, your practice, like where, um, like how, how important is, uh, is all of that? Like how, like when you are going out into, uh, out into the world, whether you're traveling overseas or whether you're traveling around uh, the US, like what is, um, what, where, where is that sort of inspiration coming from? How does travel come into that? You know, I think the inspiration just uh, comes from just existing mm. uh, and existing with eyes wide open and, and um, you know, with my work sort of being sort of rooted in sort of in just, uh, I think that, you know, it's, if anything is sort of in this sort of space of, of alarm, that would be it right. as a black male. And, and uh, but, you know, also I'm sort of uh, constantly sort of moving according to plan. I don't know. It's it's. It's all happening. Everything yeah. is happening all at once. Well, and and so in, in speaking about this this idea that you know you are you you are existing and you are and you are responding also to to different events that are happening. And I, I know that uh, Moira even talked about this in, in the sort of setup for uh, for for our conversation. The inspiration for the sound suits, which have become such an iconic part of your, of your practice. Could you, um, could, could you speak about the, the, the first sound suit and, and how you came to, to that idea? To that, uh, you know, that was in response to Rodney King in 91. And, and, you know, it's not, you know, prior to that, I was really painting. Right. And doing these sort of assemblages of, of sorts. And, you know, I think it's, uh, we never know what's going to sort of awaken our consciousness. And I think that, you know, my entire practice just did a complete 90 degree. Um, not knowing what I was making in that moment, but it was really sort of, you know, you know, it's amazing to know that, you know, our, the role of art within my sort of belief has always been my savior. So for me to sort of think about that, you know, I had this amazing sort of space to respond. Uh, you know, I was building a sculpture. Mm. That's what I was thinking in my brain. Yeah. But then I realized I could put it on and that was like, what? And so that, and then sound, sort of presented itself. And so which led me to think about the role of protest. In order to be heard, you gotta speak louder. And so that was really the beginning of a body of work that I literally sort of kept underground for about a decade because I wasn't, I didn't really know what I had made sure. in that moment. But I knew that it was life changing isn't that weird? I knew that it was like, oh shit, this is gonna change my life, but not now. <laughs> Put this on hold, but it will, it will be completely transformative. So I point. literally was building, I built probably 15 sculptures. Oh, wow. Before you showed them. Before I showed them. Because I really needed to, it was really as if, um, it was sort of like a shift in my practice that I wasn't sort of familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, this way of working, um, this sort of thing that could shield my body, my identity. So there's lots of layers to, for me to sort of grapple with and, and ask why. And so, yeah, so I did not, but I was doing work. Yeah. And that on the side sort of more or less.
and it sort of moved itself to the to the center when it well was, it when just it was like ready. it was like now <laughs> it's going to happen um, and it was really me just sort of you know again spending time with it to sure. understand why it's even here well so and and so those those first 15 um, or, or or so the, the materials that you were using, what, what were those materials? You know, I, you know, with the first one being out of twigs, um, you know, I started thinking about sort of, just sort of excess and surplus and just, you know, getting my hands on um, just that kind of volume in terms of materials, um, recognizing that I was really building a skin of sorts, um, and just this sort of abundance of, of what that sort of entails in terms of volume of, of materials. Um, so that went from twigs to sisals, uh, to bottle caps, to um, uh, shoelaces, to beads, to really what I could sort of gather to sort of build a three-dimensional cloth. And I wasn't really, I'm not at one who sketches, I just make it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, you know, I'm making it and, you know, it's like, okay, here I am. And so again, I'm sort of wide open in this sort of space of, of discovery, um, but yet very uh, curious and very committed to 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 the moment, um, to the outcome, to the imperfections, to um, just whatever it would, whatever presented itself. Sure. Well, and and it also seems like the the more you made the more you made these the the more some of these um, s some of the different components as we're seeing these kind of scroll through. Some of the different components that, that you use are uh, are really quite elaborate. Sometimes it's it's toys, or sometimes it's uh, it's other uh, little trinkets and things that, that make their way onto the onto the suits. And can can you talk about like the the selection of those uh, those those types of objects? Well, I think as time went on, I found that uh, you know as I was resourcing, which is at antique malls, flea markets. Um, that that really became the catalyst for the work, you know. It's not that I'm looking for anything, but I'm looking for everything at the same time. Um, I don't know what's going to sort of trigger or, or provide that sort of impulse, but when I see it and make that connection, I buy it. I may not use it for a year, but for some reason that thing uh, holds some amount of power and and uh, and uh, has this sort of ability to sort of be sort of altered in terms of how we, you know, what we know it to be and what it can become. Mm -hmm. So I've always been interested in sort of that sort of space of you know, the object sort of uh, providing a broader kind of read yeah. of sorts. I, I will, just as an aside, I will say that like that feels like a very, a, a very Southern idea to, to say mm -hmm. like, this is an object that has a, like a history to it, a power to it. And it also um, it is not done telling stories. It has right. the potential to, to transform into something. Yeah, and it's that sort of sort of magic. It's that sort of uh, um, you know. I tend to like sort of move it around my body, mm. like I literally have it in my hand, and then I just sort of know where its placement is, and then we start from that sort of place. So, you know, being open to that sort of uh, that kind of ritual of sorts. Yeah. Uh, navigating where the sort of spirit of that object sort of should lie or should be placed is really yeah interesting well, and and it also feels like you know even in describing the way that you're you're figuring that out like obviously many of these 
many of these sound suits get activated with some sort of action, with some sort of choreography. Um, and, and I wonder like, how, much of, how much of that is uh, when you are creating the works, are you thinking about, okay, I'm going to place these here because this, th this will encourage me to move in a particular way, or? Well, you know, with the sounds, it's, it's really sort of two bodies of work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the sounds that are sculptures, and then there's sounds that are made and designed for performance, which sure. really do not hold right. the sort of uh, sort of objects of sorts. Um, and those are sort of to only be viewed as sculpture. But, you know, it's interesting, you know, as a young kid, and I would go to the Museum of Natural History, and I would see all these, like, amazing artifacts, and I'm thinking, like, I'm sort of torn between two places. Like, you know, it's in a museum, but it reads that it serves this. Mm. And so that was really sort of something that I was very interested in was that, you know, can it stand as a sculptural form? Yeah. And can that be enough? As well as, you know, it being performative. And, and so, you know, so it's really sort of these two bodies of work. Performance suits, you know, it's really about sort of thinking about materials that can sort of handle the stress and, and the, um, the wear and tear. Um, and so it's a different kind of sure. process. Well, and, and, you know, actually it's up on the screen right now, but this, uh, the, the work that is in the Dirty South right now mm -hmm. um, is, is a work from 2010, uh, but it is also using, using twigs. And so, um, you know, this, you know, the very first sound suit that, that you made using twigs and then revisiting that, uh, that same material n nearly two decades afterwards. Um, like, is that, uh, can, can you speak a little bit to, to the specific work that's in the show? Yeah, you know, I've not seen it in a long time. <laughs> so when I, when I saw it today, yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> was this like a good? Was this a good okay? It's like okay. Uh, it was a good okay. Okay, that's uh, good. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it was really you know when I. It, it really depends on where I'm at in the studio. You, you know, I think what I was interested in at that particular time is really stripping down, mm -hmm. like color, sure. and sort of and just really sort of just sort of focusing on just that one sort of material um, and form mm. and, and just sort of allowing that to sort of carry, carry it. Uh, you know, that form, you know, comes from, you know, me thinking about uh, the sort of shapes that hold power. And so, you know, I was thinking about uh, uh, the mitre sort of hat sort of structure, the clan uniform, and then a condom. <laughs> so that's how I sort of came to that particular form. And so, um, and it's really so, you know, and it's about this sort of, you know, the stance, this sort of projection that yeah. sort of, that it sort of has and presents itself. And so really, uh, but at that moment was really me sort of just stripping down color, excess, uh, this way of just sort of building in, in the sort of, sort of dimensional way and just sort of streamlining and sort of pulling back to see what would be there yeah. in that sort of moment. Well, and, and, and it is it's such a striking, such a striking work. And, uh, and as folks approach it, it, it does look like it is, um, I mean, again, as you said, the, the pose of it, it looks like a power stance. It, it looks like, um, like a figure that is standing there and, and not, not necessarily in a confrontational way, but, but it, it feels like, you know, this is a this is a sturdy thing, or this at least appears to be. Well, a you know, thing. I think it's all about you know, like uh, you know, sort of uh, standing, you know, fully grounded. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as confrontational it could be, uh, but it's all about sort of me sort of 
toying around and sort of, you know, playing with uh, ideas of, of power and, and um, sort of reclaiming my sort of self in, in a sense as well. Uh, uh, you know, color pattern sort of adornment has always been a sort of form of rebellious application for me. Mm. It's like, you know, you know, as a kid growing up and was, you know, told you're like a handsome kid or you're beautiful. And yet I think about like society has a different sort of image of, of that. And so I'm just sort of always sort of tossing these two sort of things around. But that always sort of becomes the more dominant. What, of what, which one always becomes more dominant? The, the beauty. Okay. Yeah. I want to jump into that because I, I think that um, <coughs> very few people who, who look at your work would uh, would not say that it's um, that, that it's beautiful because it is like this is oftentimes the works that you create are absolutely stunning and and this idea of, of beauty is is something that comes and has woven itself throughout your your practice for for years. And, and I, I wonder if you could speak to speak a little bit further to to those ideas of how how and when you sort of em, employ different versions of beauty in the in the work. You know, I think you know, growing up as a young artist, you know, being in undergrad, being in grad school, you know, there was just sort of things that you could not do. Mm in or sort of imply as a part as part of one's development beauty i think was one of it one of them uh, craft was another but you know for me i'm thinking like oh my god i'm just you know i was raised around that mm. you know i was raised around makers uh musicians uh and so i didn't know anything else and nor did i want to abandon that part of my belief. Um, and so I've always sort of really, have always sort of worked on the edge. I'm always on the top of the fence. So like if we want to sort of sway to the left, we can. Mm. I'm not committed to anything really, <laughs> but I'm committed to everything at the same time. Uh -huh. So a very diplomatic approach. You to, know, to whatever I need to do in order for me to move accordingly. Um, and so being able to be in that sort of flex space, sort of, uh, you know, I wanted to have that conversation about art and craft. Yeah. And just sort of like, but I think it's really, for me, it's always been about the degree of one or the other. And just sort of like, if I, if I go one step further, it, I could lose, I could lose the, the fight or the, the message. And so I'm always just like taking it to that edge. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's always, it's, it's just sort of, it's interesting to me to sort of uh, continue to have these sort of conversations around that. Yeah. And then when I think about like what's going on today, it's like, it's all, it's so wide open, so yeah, it's. Well, and I, I do think this is interesting because there is, there, there is at least historically or traditionally this hierarchy between, between art and, and craft. And, and I think that, um, or this, this at least like perceived hierarchy. And, and I do think that like, as, you, as you sort of t like, uh, like walk that tightrope between the, between the two and, and uh, sort of embrace both sides of this, um, have you have you seen in the time that you've been doing, uh, or in, in the time that you've been working, that that conversation has has shifted, or that like that that sort of conversation around like um, you know like, well no this is sort of like the realm of high art this is the realm of craft. No, I don't care. You don't care. <laughs> All right, good. No. Good. Yeah. I just I just you know who made those rules anyway. Who made, like, at the end of the day, like, who made those decisions? Yes. Yeah. So I think that when you sort of put it out on the table like that and you're like, no, it doesn't apply to me. So, like, I think that we as artists have to sort of, sort of move 
uh, the spectrum in a, in a different, well, we are moving it in a different direction. And uh, because, you know, you make up your own rules. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, it certainly seems. It certainly seems that you have had a career of making making your own rules when it comes to de defining defining your own your own voice and your own language and in, in terms of how you are creating works that that push boundaries and that and that encourage folks to to rethink preconceived notions that they that they have. Um, that's not a question. That's just me like lobbing you with some. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I do want to talk about um, because this is the, this is a project that was um, shown here in Northwest Arkansas uh, just a couple years ago until mm -hmm. um, and thinking about how that part of your practice um, or that that particular project uh, is, is really something that um, that on the surface seemed like it was a, like a departure from what you had. Uh, what, what you had been doing for, for some folks in terms of like it may have felt a little bit different from the sound the sound suits, but can you contextualize that for, for folks? Well, you know, that project started at Mass Mocha. Mm -hmm. uh, Denise Marconish, the curator, uh, came to my studio in Chicago uh, and said, oh, I want to invite you to do a project at Mass Mocha Gallery 5, which is the largest gallery. I'll come back in a year and, and see what you've decided to create. So I'm not thinking about that project at all. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, know she, I knew she was coming maybe three months and I'm like, Ugh, I don't know. <laughs> like, something has got to trigger or, or, or I need a jump start or something. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. All I knew is that I went to Mass Smoke. I've been there a number of times, but I also went when the gallery was completely empty. Mm -hmm. And I just laid in the center of the gallery and just sort of like just took it in. I just needed to see the space empty. It was, it's the size of a small football field. And so I'm thinking like, yes, I don't know what, but yes. <laughs> it's just, this feels right. You know, I, can, I, can, I just needed to wrap my head around it. And then Michael Brown happened. And that was the catalyst that sort of created until. So I'm in the studio, that's happening. I am like, just like losing it, spinning out of control, like overwhelmed emotionally. And then I was just sort of the thought of, is racism in heaven sort of came to mind. And so that really was the catalyst for that project. And so the crystal cloudscape is how, from just that sort of statement was, that's what I made. And then the wind spinners, uh, which is a kinetic sort of spinning forest. You know, it's really me sort of thinking about that, the sort of disconnect in terms of, uh, you know, who, th you know, who this uh, pertains to and, and the, the absence of, of those that feel removed from, from that. And in reality, it's really in all of our backyards. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when you come into Mass Smoker here at the moment, it was like this enchanting kind of amazing sort of kinetic moving sort of uh, installation. But as you got close to the wind spinners, you saw guns, bullets. Right. Teardrop. So it's like me sort of like doing come, 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 and like yeah. in the stomach. Um, and, so, and so, you know, again, it's, uh, it's really sort of, you know, something will trigger something that then sort of gets the sort of ball rolling and, and sort of me responding. And, and then thinking about the piece and thinking about the social sort of application and practice around that and community outreach. So it was really this immersive installation that also invited artists right. and community services to uh, use it as needed. Yeah. Well, and, and also, I, I like the way that you uh, rebuffed this. Yeah, and also, you know, 
at Mass Mocha, Denise, you know, she said, oh, by the way, I do, do not want to see sound suits. And I was like, yes. <laughs> but I was already sort of transitioning out of that work anyway. But I wanted to put you into the belly of a sound suit. That's really what that was about. Right. And so, yeah. Well, and, and I think that's one of the things that you said uh, about you know, when you saw the spinners, when folks, when folks would walk into the space and they see this, and, it's, uh, and, and it is, again, beautiful. It's also um, you know, sort of enticing. It pulls folks, pulls folks in. And, um, and there, there's a word that, that comes to mind for me that is often a bad word in the, in the art world. And I want to I like, toss it out here and see how it lands with you. <laughs> um, spectacle. Uh, is this is this like when when we say like spectacle within the within the art world? Is this something that um, is that a good thing, a bad thing? I, I don't really think about it as spectacle. Okay, I, you know, yeah. So I don't. I never even considered it as that. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Spectacle to me to me means performative in some sort of aspect, sure. and it wasn't that. Sure. Uh, so. But I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And was it that to me? No. Good. I'm. I'm curious. <laughs> was what was it? Was it that to you? No. I. I think that. <laughs> especially on on stage right now. As I. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for. You said like. Before this, we were like no curveballs to either one of us, and so we just threw <laughs> curveballs to each other. It was great. Uh, no, I, I don't think um, I, I don't think special is quite the is quite the right, right word, but I do think that there is this uh, th this idea of um, uh, wonder and and this apprehension that that people have sometimes um, within the art world. The, this thought that like if something is uh, it is truly remarkable to look at, truly like immersive. If it is, um, if it is stunning in those ways, uh, that like, can it also like really push me in, in a direction like to really think contemplatively? Um, and I, I think that um, you know, an exhibition like like Until is is proof that yes, it absolutely can can get you to engage deeply and think um, in, in really um, in, in really profound ways. Um, see, but like yeah, you just did but it again, where it's no. like me, 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 like compliment. But no, it's yeah. back to that, you know, being on top of the fence. Mm. You know, I got, could I make it a spectacle? Oh, sure. <laughs> but I know that it's not. There's a seriousness to the work that must sort of be first and foremost in front. And so, you know, there's things that I think that. Um, the, you know, conscious decisions when it comes to subjects that are very heavy and, yeah. and we're struggling with. And so I don't take it lightly. And I think, you know, a spectacle could sort of shift uh, why it's here sure. and how it's supposed to serve in a sense. I, I wonder with with until being such uh, s such a big project and, and being a, a project that um, that again came to the momentary and we got to enjoy it um, ha has it shifted the your your practice in uh, in any sort of significant way that that you can look back and say like oh yeah like that was that was very transformative for me it, it, it has shifted um, in terms of you know, I think, you know, I think I'm an artist with the civic sort of responsibility. So, you know, I'm always sort of thinking about sort of, you know, how how does the work serve and and sort of outreach mm -hmm. for the most part. I think that I'm not really, you know, the museum shows, I get it, but it's really the sort of outreach I'm more interested in, just how you know, a project is used and how it can sort of provide a uh, platform. And so, you know, that project was, really led me uh, down this amazing path of doing probably seven additional projects after that that were really massive, but yet very much uh, built on community sort of outreach. And so, 
you know, I go in with a plan, but it's very loose mm -hmm. because of the outreach, you know. I don't know that because I haven't yet worked with uh, this community or that community, but I'm, you know, I know what the foundation is. And so what we build on top of that is really, it, and is always remarkable, just the testimonies that come through a, a residency of sorts is life-changing. So, you know, I'm sort of have a different agenda mm. in mind. Uh, yes, I make this object, it is for the community, and so that's done, but the outreach is what I don't know, which is where I'm mostly sort of committed to, I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, and it also feels like, um, again, this, uh, when you're doing, when you're doing these community-based projects, these, these ones that are inviting in um, uh, or creating this opportunity for, for you to be in collaboration with so many other, other folks, like, it, it also feels in some ways very in line with this idea of, like, you know, I only know what I'm, what I'm making as I'm, as I'm making it, right? Like, this, this sense of, of discovery that feels like it, it continues throughout your, I mean, yeah, changes over over time, but feels like it's still very very much part of your your practice and ha always has been. Um, I want to. I know that uh, that we are getting close to the time that we need to uh, uh, open it up for questions, but I, I did want to um, uh, sort of like hype and opportunity for, for the fact that you are going to be back again um, <laughs> very soon. Um, very soon. Very soon, uh, in, in just a couple months, um, for, for the Format Festival. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if you could speak um, a, at all about um, you know, what, uh, what, what we might see um, when, when you are back I'm not, that. I'm not sure what you're going to see. <laughs> I, was on, I was on the grounds today, uh, sort of just scouting out um, where it's going to take place and you know, thinking about possibilities of what could happen. Uh, you know, we're going to, you know, I can tell you that we're going to engage with a marching band mm -hmm. cool. at some point cool. through the festival. Um, and we're going to really sort of really think more about these sort of invasions, mm -hmm. so sort of these sort of performance invasions that will just happen when they happen. I don't know exactly what, when, at this moment that will be, but uh, we're going to work with uh, all local performers. Excellent. Which is awesome. Um, yeah. Great. Well, and that is September 20. Around like the 24th or so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so everybody, think about coming on, coming on back if you uh, if you don't already live here. Um, uh, do we have questions that folks? Uh, no questions. This is so strange. Um, lots of questions. How about we start with you? I have a question about scale. It seems like as I watch your work, start from person specific then site specific, and then now I see your stuff wrapping around buses, you're not in the subway, you're on top of the building. So tell me where the change <laughs> of scale, how that represents your own personal development over time. You know, I just finished uh, this amazing project in New York. At the at, with MTA, which is yes, the subway. Uh, I was to it today, watching an interview about it. It was on today's news. Yeah, and uh, you know that was an interesting project because that was a project that wasn't developed in the studio, so that was developed in Munich. So I had to fly there a number of times in the process of that being sort of created. But you know, I'm going into that project like. I'm not sure what I think about my work in Mosaic. I've not, it never dawned on me to, to consider that, but I'm open mm -hmm. to it. Uh, but, you know, I had reservations the entire way until I went there. And then when I went there, it was like, oh my God, like, like mind boggling, unbelievable. And that's hard for me to say f f most of the time. But um, 
And then when it came to New York and was installed, you know, it just sort of, I mean, it's massive. And so for me to think about like, it's for the people and that it's permanent, that it's going to be there forever, long after I'm gone, it's like, what? <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I think for me with that project, with any sort of large project, it's really sort of the transference of the essence. How do I transfer the essence of my practice into a different medium? Um, and if I can do that, then it's a go. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that opens up a whole new sort of set of opportunities because now I'm thinking of some mosaic sort of sculptural forms that are sounds related. Um, but, you know, that project sort of then influenced this sort of new body of work. Um, so I'm always, you know, I may not sort of know uh, at the front end of how something may sort of conclude, but I'm always open to just sort of the possibility. Um, and I think that that is how I've always been. It's not, you know, it's like the format festival that's coming here. We're going to be doing these improvisational performances, but, you know, we may be interfacing with Herbie Hancock. So I mean, that could just sort of shift a whole nother way of operating. And improv is like fabulous, and particularly if you're working with movers that are like fearless, mm -hmm. that are just gonna go all in, and so we all will just sort of, sort of have these sort of moments of church and, and testimonies on the dance floor. I mean, that is just like, you can't, you can't sort of script that. You have to just sort of be open and in the presence of it. And so, again, that's always been the sort of space of, for me to sort of, uh, that I'm very sort of fear, fearlessly committed to. It's like when I do these projects and then we build this community sort of program around it. We're building the program, but I have no idea what the outcome is going to be. But to create space of possibility is amazing for a lot of artists that, that don't have that sort of platform. And for them to imagine what is possible is everything. So, you know, that's how I sort of think about uh, all of that. I remember as a young artist and I saw Avenelli for the first time and I was like, ah, oh, I want to be on that stage. And so, you know, when you're sort of thinking about that and sort of imagining what that could be, and you arrive to that place within your life and, you know, so I get it. Yeah. This person? Yep. First of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for honoring yourself because it's so, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, I, the word that comes to mind when I think of your work is exuberance. Um, and I appreciate that very much. Even in the seriousness of your art, there's an exuberance. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. Um, but I was, um, I had two things. One is, I love it that you're thinking about g revisiting sound suits. And I was wondering if you've ever thought about uh, doing a sound suit we could walk into, you know, sort of be inside of. I don't know, just something I was worrying, wondering about. And then my next question is, you work in such a wild variety of materials. Um, and I was wondering if there's any particular tool or piece of equipment that you most enjoy working with. Uh, walking into a sound suit, Until was that? Did you see Until when it was at the Momentary? Um, it's going to be, it may be appearing, I can't say where, because I don't know yet. Uh, I do know, but it's not finalized. Um, so, yes, I've sort of made work where you can sort of you find your way into it. Uh, 
It, there was three parts to your question. Uh, materials. Or, or favorite tool. Um, favorite tool. This, the, no. Is, that's a fascinating question. There's question. no favorite yeah. tool. Uh, it's not, I don't know if it's my favorite tool. I use it. I don't, <laughs> I don't think about it like a favorite. It's like, this is what I have to use. Like if, it's in, if I have to use clay where on the wheel or what have you. I don't really, I don't know. It's interesting to think about it that way. You know, in the studio right now, and I'm sort of getting ready to start painting. I know nothing about painting, but, <laughs> and yet I know everything about painting. So <laughs> it's, it's gonna be fine. Uh, yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, right here. Oh my God, Scott, no way! Yeah. And I just wanted to show you this invitation from an installation you did at my house. At the your house. Day project. This is when I was like maybe 1999. <laughs> no. Scott, yes. Scott allowed me and my friend Gregory Greg to completely Doherty. renovate his house. Yeah. <laughs> So I was wondering it was how, amazing. how maybe the box of snakes that you have, that I have one of the boxes of snakes, how that led to maybe the sound suits and because they were found sticks and stuff. Right. So just a question. Wow. <laughs> Not a plant, like we. No, no. I just, I just, yeah, just I up. just saw you were down here and thought I'd drive down for the day. Great. And I brought this copy of the invitation. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think you know, 19 years old. I mean, wow. But it's interesting to think about it. Like you know, I was building stuff even at that age of. It's, you know, found materials and, and sort of excess. And I think growing up with like seven brothers, mm. one year apart, you know, I think that like when I had to take hand me downs from my brother was just like devastating to me. <laughs> and that's when I started cutting up and remaking stuff. So I think it, you know, that was the beginning of me sort of reclaiming and sort of re sort of um, considering, you know, bringing value to something that I, that uh, I needed to, to, to do that to. I needed to sort of alter and, and shift uh, something where it became mine. And so I think that that was the beginning of that sort of of a moment, uh, and your house was also, we knew nothing about, like, <laughs> decoration or, <laughs> you just was like, go for it, and we were like, <laughs> but it was, it, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Um, I did my dissertation on new genre of public art, which is basically what you're doing in your latest projects, which is bringing the community in and allowing them to basically inform your artwork. And the biggest stumbling block when I was writing this uh, 10 years ago was uh, the aesthetics, um, bringing, bringing the aesthetics down and the community portion up. And I think it's really cool that that doesn't seem to play a part in your artwork. Um, and so I would like to know, one, how you rally a community, bring them together, and um, allow them to inform the piece, 
And you've said, you, you know, every community is different, but how do you organize a community to come together and create something that is theirs? Um, and then my second question, oh gosh. Right. Um, you know, I think I'll just let you answer that. I think, <laughs> I think I, the I had a lot of questions, sorry. <laughs> I think the first part of that question is really, you know, that the artwork can stand on its own, first and foremost, that it does not have to sort of rely on community sort of uh, in terms of support, but it, it, that it's, but it's built in a way that it, it can open itself up to community. And so what we tend to do, like, I made the decision that, you know, I could bring, I have two choices. I could bring all my performers that I work with regularly in Chicago, New York, or I could, like, not bring any of them and, like, go to Shreveport, Louisiana, and, like, scout out who's here. And that's where it becomes interesting for me. It's like, I want to know who lives here. This project is here, so who lives here that I can work with that can help sort of facilitate the next sort of level? And I'm telling you, the amount of talent that are in these places is like mind boggling, that I'm like, why are you here? Why are you here? But they're there for whatever reason, and so, you know, it takes, it takes time to sort of uh, pull together a team that's working on the grounds there and, 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 and uh, for us to consider, but it's like amazing. So again, it's, you know, I sort of have a list of what we need and, and we sort of, you know, like one dancer knows 50 dancers, one musician knows 50 musicians. So before you know it, you've got this entire uh, community of, of amazing sort of people that are very much uh, on board and everybody gets paid and that makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pay people for, for their work. Right, you have to. And then we'll go to. My name is John. I'm an artist from Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I guess I'm a bit of a groupie because I've seen you here three times now. But um, I love your work. Good job. And uh, um, so I'm I'm an artist, but I'm also you know a queer artist. And I'm just wondering, you identify as black male, and I'm just wondering, I mean, I see the queer sensibility, the aesthetic in your work, even the narrative in all that you do, but it's not so obvious. Can you talk about maybe some of the queer uh, elements in your work? Is that something you're comfortable doing? Sure. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm queer as well, um, but... You know, I think it's just there in the work. It's not that I think about it as queer work or, or straight work or what have you. It is what I have to do. It's how I make work. Uh, it's not defined by who I am as a person. Uh, I'm an artist. Uh, I happen to be black, but that doesn't mean anything either. So I think that, uh, you know, I celebrate that in my work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all there. Hi, Nick. One last question. I have a question. The amazing um, Valerie Cassell Oliver. Hey, Valerie. Um, <laughs> you did that performance, that collaborative performance at Navy Pier years ago, and it was the element of unmasking. It was a very different type of performance. Uh, and I wanted to know the compulsion to unmask. You know, that performance uh, titled Upright. Uh, that performance was two things. It was 
You know, I was thinking a lot about like what goes on in the studio behind the scenes that you never see. You know, you only sort of see these amazing images, but you never see and see how that all comes together. You never see how SoundSuit is built. Uh, and so in this particular performance, I'm working with a group of, of uh, performers where they strip down and behind them would be this, this sort of landscape of objects, like maybe 300. And then there's a group of practitioners that come and build a sound suit, right, as, as you're watching. So it's really sort of this sort of stripping down and sort of rebuilding. And it's really sort of coming out of this sort of rite of passage uh, uh, sort of moment um, th that uh, I was thinking a lot about young black kids that don't have that, that sort of moment in their, in their life where is, where is the, there is that sort of shift, that sort of rite of passage. So it's really was sort of built around that and sort of empowering oneself. And so they are then sort of completely stripped down and you then see them being adorned and their entire body becomes this sort of sculptural object. They, their identity completely uh, sort of disappears and then they stand. Um, and so it really sort of comes out of that. But I also was thinking about, you know, showing the audience for the first time how sound suit is constructed in a sense. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick, and thank you for your, uh, for your time, for the sure. conversation. Thank you. And um, we will have a, a sort of brief pause before the next, the, the next panel. So thank you. Good. Thank you.